Check one, two. Good morning, proximity. Again, uh, folks, if you're out, sorry, we're a little, little late on the go today. Again, just working through some kinks here. Um, if you're out in the lobby, come on in, folks. We're going to get rolling with our service this morning. Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. The extended summer we've had, a little cooler today, but certainly not as cool as, as it's going to be in January. So uh, let's stand together, if you will, and we're going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to dive into our worship, and we're continuing with our series uh, today on Jesus Is, so we'll keep going with that. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the beautiful weather we've had uh, in this coming fall. Just thank you for the fact that you go ahead of us and you prepare a way for us. And uh, we thank you that we can come even here today, uh, here at this uh, school at Sacred Heart, to gather, to lift high the name of Jesus, and to thank you for all the good things that you've done and are doing in our lives. And so we want to give you this next uh, chunk of time. Lord, please just speak to us today. Show us areas of our life that we maybe haven't surrendered to, that we, we want to give to you today. Or uh, help us to take a next step in worship to to just really engage with you and surrender our heart uh, at a deeper level. And in all of these things, God, that your name would be lifted high and that many men and women and children uh, would come to know you and uh, believe in you, the living God. So we thank you for your great love and we're here to worship you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together.
lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my name.
in your son Jesus. And Jesus is our living hope. So we thank you that no matter what might happen on this side of eternity, our deaths may go to the grave or we may go to see you, however that might look. You are our hope that we live beyond this world into the next. And so thank you that, God, you give us that promise. And thank you that you've sealed it through your son's death and burial and resurrection and coming again. So thank you for that today. We rejoice in it. We celebrate it today in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Would you say hi to your neighbor who's sitting next to you there and maybe a new friend, a church family member, and take a moment to say hi to them. Bless you as you do that. Welcome to our online audience as well. Glad to have you with us. If you're watching this on Facebook Live right now or maybe on YouTube a little later, glad to have you. I know many of you picked this up through the week or share it as well. Thank you for doing that, for just forwarding it on to a friend and saying, you know, here's a, here's a great topic that we, our church has been doing on who Jesus is. Uh, so I encourage you, to those you maybe are sharing your faith with church family, to uh, pass along uh, the sermon series to them or encourage others to check it out. Check out our church. Here's a link. Uh, kids ministry give you a couple announcements before we dive into uh, our third in the series today kids ministry is up and running here at proximity we have lots of room for kids right up to uh, age 11 grade 5 i think that is and so bring your kids out young families uh, moms and dads come and get a break here we have coffee as well uh, so come on in and enjoy that time and your kids will have a program designed for them as well uh, soup Sundays coming up next Sunday. Uh, we had we took a break from Soup Sundays, did barbecues. Now back to Soup Sunday. But what we need to do is just build our list a little bit. So if you are able to help, uh, next Sunday is set. I think we have our uh, soups ready. Uh, well, they're not ready now, but they're going to be made and be prepared, uh, and they'll be brought, but we still are looking to build that list, so if you're available maybe for October or even into November, uh, just sign up on the welc- at the welcome desk on the way out, and we will put you on the list for uh, those upcoming events. And this is just a moment, the last Sunday of every month, where we like to take some time to connect. As we don't uh, yet have our own church building, uh, we're believing for that. However God provides that, we're looking forward to that. And and if that be his will, so be it. Uh, But until then, we're trying to grab any little bit of fellowship (laughs) in homes or in the lobby here. So that's what that's about. Encourage you to plan on staying with us for lunch. And then our hymn sing, this is an outreach of our church to Bridalwood Trails uh, Retirement Home. Uh, And if you'd like to be a part of that, that's today at 2 o'clock. And if you can arrive a little bit early, around 1.30, 1.40 or so, and uh, the hymns are sung there, the, there's uh, lots of hymn books, and uh, the residents join in with some of our folks, so we'd encourage you, if you, if you would love to sing, and be, uh, it'd be a ministry to some people who can't usually get out to uh, maybe a local church, this is a great way to uh, just be a, a smiling face and uh, the love of the Lord shining through your life to someone else. And then here's our website. I always love to throw this in there, not just for the donate button. I know that's a part of it that many of us give that way online. Uh, But also there are so many other links here. Uh, The Next Steps links is great. If you ever just have some time this week, check that out and look at all the little rabbit trails that come off of that. Questions about who Jesus is, steps to faith in him or to salvation, prayer requests, uh, etc., all under Next Steps. And then uh, the ministries that we offer, uh, missions, uh, missionaries we support, sermons, all the past sermons are linked there. So there's a lot of different uh, resources there that, again, you could share uh, with the welcome cards, the uh, flyers that are there, and we just encourage you to, uh, to go ahead and avail yourself of those. Uh, Going to dive in here. So this is now week three in this series on Jesus Is. Who is Jesus really? And this is really us as Christians, Christ followers, um, saying who we see scripturally, biblically, Jesus says that he is. And God the Father says that Jesus is. Uh, The world has a lot of different views on who Jesus is. If you remember uh, week one, we looked at the four pictures, and there's more than that, but a good teacher, uh, you know, know, an iconic historical figure. Uh, There are different ideas in the world about who Jesus was, uh, we would say Jesus is because we know he's alive today. Amen? Coming soon. We just sang about that. He's our living hope. And so as believers, we're looking into this truth of who Jesus is. This Sunday, we're looking at uh, this, so every week we've changed it. Uh, And this week, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Now, it's an older phrase. Um, You know, in my household, I'm not called 
the Lord. Uh, in old English days, you know, you would say, yes, my Lord. Uh, you know, maybe we should reinstitute that. I could get used to that, you know. Uh, no, probably not a good practice. Probably won't be followed. Uh, but anyway, if you watch some old British movies or, uh, uh, you know, such, you, you, you'd see that phrase used maybe a little more frequently, my Lord. Um, and uh, so we're looking at this today, and as we do, for some of us, we might say, well, what, what really does that mean? So I found this great little quote, and then I want to give you some practical uh, uh, thoughts around it. But the, the phrase, Jesus is Lord, indicates that Jesus is God. Jesus holds all authority, and we'll give you some scripture with this, all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28 and 18. He is Lord of the Sabbath, Luke 6 and 5. Our only sovereign and Lord, Jude 1, verse 4. And the Lord of Lords, amen? Revelation 17, 14. And so we're not going to have time to look through all of the different references to Jesus as Lord. But Jesus as Lord is mentioned over 747 times just in the New Testament. How about that? So if people say, well, I don't know about this, you know, Jesus is Lord, nice for you Christians to think that and, and, and relate that to the fact that Jesus is God. Well, over 747 times in your Bible uh, does it say Jesus is Lord. So I think we're on fairly safe ground today to dig into this one as a topic. And I want to give you uh, where we were last week, at least at the end of last week, I had given you uh, quickly a, a verse from Revelation 19. I'm going to kind of springboard off that into our text this morning, all right? So, reading from Revelation 19, verses 12 and 13, we, we referenced this at the end last week. John, in, his, uh, in the Revelation there, says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True, and he's speaking here of Jesus. With justice he judges and wages war, his eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and this is what we talked about last Sunday, it was our topic title, and his name is the Word of God. And so that's where we went last week. And a couple more verses here, just three more at the end of this. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And look at this part. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so uh, just another verse there. And again, because we had tucked it in last week and it helps us transition from uh, the Word of God to the Lord of, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And part of our understanding as Christian Christ followers is that I'm not the boss, right? <laughs> That's essentially the, the bottom line when it comes to Lord is, you know, who's the boss? And I don't know if you're this way, but at, often we'll come into rooms and we will, uh, if we're, maybe it's a new environment to us or a new workplace or uh, a new friend group or sporting group or club, whatever it might be, we often kind of try and get into that group, maybe make a friend, and then we listen for a bit, right? If you're anything like me, you listen for a bit and go, Who's really in charge here? <laughs> Who's the boss? How does this go? What's the flow? How does, the, what's, how does this all work? You know, kind of thing. Um, I was laughing yesterday. Heather was sharing a little story. Naomi, our daughter, has been helping another family with their dog. And uh, she would go to their house and sleep over there. And she has this past weekend a bit. And the first time she did that, she went over, and it was a couple of nights she was there with the, the family dog, and the dog didn't know her that well, and, and the dog would kind of listen to Naomi and not always that well, and um, so anyway, then Heather went over on, I think it was the third night, Heather went over, and Heather wasn't going to put up with the nonsense from the dog, and I think the dog realized that pretty quickly. So even though Naomi, the dog knew Naomi for two days, but Heather, being the mom and the one with authority, comes into the house, and even the dog recognized well, I don't have to listen to Naomi anymore. It's now mom, you know, kind of thing. And we were laughing about that and realizing that, you know, even, even the dog could understand, you know, okay, two people now, who's in charge? And right away knew, oh, mom is now going to be taking charge. And we all, all of us, understand this principle. No matter where we look at, we look to who's in charge, who's the boss, who's the master, who gets to call the final shots. And I like how one author says it here. He says, when, when I don't have it here on the screen for you, but I'll read it. When we say Jesus is Lord, when we confess Jesus is Lord, what you're saying is, I, I like the practicality here, 
Jesus gets to call all the shots for my life. Jesus can tell me how I should think about myself, about marriage, about the world. Jesus is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And not me, I live to serve my master. I like that. I live to serve my master. And that's what you're saying. Now let me just put a little piece in here. That's why we see a lot of people struggling to lay their lives down and say, okay, Jesus, you be Lord. Because they're still trying, right? They're still not going to give up. I want my own way, my own dreams, my own plans. I don't need God. Things are going well enough for me right now. I'm not willing to surrender or lay that down, right? There's many people. We have friends or family members, co-workers who, who no, 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 I don't need God. Life's going pretty good. And for most of the things that have gone bad, I have a bank account or I have some solutions or a bag of tricks. And we have realized that many of us here today, most of us here today have said, you know what? I do not have the answers. <laughs> I cannot solve these things. And, and, and money or wisdom or power or strength or whatever it might be is not really the answer. I need Jesus. Now, when you get to that place, and I'm going to dig into that today, when you get to the place where you realize you need God and God says the way to me is through my son, Jesus, he's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's a surrendering moment of saying, Jesus, you are Lord. I bow my knee to you. I confess with my mouth, you are Lord. You're the boss, right? As this author says, you get to call the shots. You get to say what is and what isn't. Uh, let's get to our text. So Philippians 2, that was all free. How about that? Uh, Philippians 2, <laughs> verses 1 to 13. I'm going to take three thoughts. Very um, profound but simple uh, truth here. And so this would be an easy uh, message to really share with those who have a question about what Christians or what it means to be to say yes to Jesus. If you were going to share it, it'd be a great uh, message to, to share in that way. Philippians 2 verses 1 to 13 says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, you, you've, you've said yes to him, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now look at this. Who being, and this, we're going to look at it, but who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And verse uh, 9, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now in my, more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Uh, before we get to our first thought here, I had uh, the refereeing season has started off again. And uh, I was, uh, I think it was Friday, I was assigned three games all together with young kids. And they thought it was starting off easy. They made me the referee for the first game. And these were 14-year-olds. And I thought, oh, this isn't bad. 14-year-olds aren't that fast. Turns out they are. They're, they're quite fast, especially considered, can, you know, uh, compared to me. And I found that out at the end of the first game as I was skating back and forth with them, and I thought, okay, this is a lot of work. And now in the second game, I got to be the linesman. That's a much easier job to just stand by the blue line and say if it's offside or it's, it's playable puck. And, and so I thought that was easy. And then the next referee was saying, this is busy. And I said, yeah, because they're 15-year-olds, so they're a little faster, you know. And then we got to the 16-year-olds. The last guy had to skate with the 16-year-olds, and I thought, we should just pray for him right now. Because, you know, we were all, you know, my age or older, you know, and, and, we're, and I said to him, are you okay for this? He goes, yeah, the one advantage is they clean the ice in between the second and third period. And I thought, what? I didn't get that. You know, he got, he got that break. Um, but I realized 
The 14-year-olds didn't complain so much. The 15-year-olds complained a little more. The 16-year-olds, believe it or not, they know everything. Did you know that? 16-year-olds, teenagers, know everything. They know more than the referee, more than their coach, more than everyone else. Uh, But when you hit the whistle and you're wearing the stripes and the red armbands, guess who's the boss? You are as the referee. And they find that out really quickly. And the last referee who's been refing for, I think he said, 20 years, uh, so much more experienced than me, I remember at one point, hit the whistle, and the kid turned around at him, and it was an evident call, and he, he, he points at him, and I think it was tripping or something, and the kid went to say something, and he just looked at him and said, not another word. <laughs> and I looked at him and I thought, we can do that? I didn't know we could do that. I like that move, you know? And the kid just looked at him, looked at his coach, and the coach went, hmm. <laughs> and he just skated to the box, and I thought, wow, there's a recognition of who the boss is. You're not, your coach is not. Your mom who's banging on the glass and whipping her purse around her head, she's not at this point. It's this referee. He's the boss. He gets to say what is, and you have to go to the box. And there was this moment of realization for this 16-year-old that didn't matter what he wanted to say or how he thought it should go. None of that mattered in this moment. There was a boss. And it didn't matter, what I'm saying is, what he believed, what he thought about himself or about the moment. Believing is our first thought here. We are encouraged in the text to believe, first of all, of of all these things, to believe on Jesus or believe that Jesus is Lord. That's the very first step to understanding lordship. You can't have Jesus as Lord, but really not believe he's Lord. There needs to be a work in your heart that says, yeah, Jesus is who he says he is, and he's the boss, and I'm not. And I'm surrendering to that. I'm giving up to that. Philippians, he says it this way. Remember the text there where it says, if you have any encouragement, you're united with Christ, any comfort. Uh, any common sharing of the Spirit, any tenderness. Look what it says in verse 2. You're being like-minded, have, having the same love, and look what it says, being one in spirit and of one mind. There's a believing that is being talked to uh, by, the apostle, or by um, Paul here to the church, saying, listen, Philippian church, you've come together to believe something, to understand something, to be of one mind, one heart, one thought. You understand this truth, and that has brought you together as one. Hang on to that. And that doesn't come easily. When we come into a room and we all have different opinions about what we should do or what we should eat or where we should go, um, you know, that can be really frustrating. You find that as a family or a friend group. When all of a sudden you all have the same hankering for food or you all want to go to the same place, isn't that so much more exciting where you just go, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, there's a unity, there's an excitement, there's a belief that creates a power, a momentum. Well, that's what is being said to the church here. You've all come together, and you've believed this. You're like-minded. You know Jesus is Lord, and you've come together to believe he's the boss, and you're not. And he says that's a beautiful thing. That's bringing um, a love and a comfort and a common sharing. Your spirit, your minds are intertwined around this very thing. And then he says, so when that's happening, look at verse 3, don't get selfish again. (laughs) Don't start thinking that you know what's right. Have humility, he says in verse 3. And don't just look out for your own interests and your own desires. When you've started to believe upon Jesus and look to him and surrender to him, stay in that place of believing that he is Lord and you're not. And then in verse 5, he kind of brings clarity to it. Have that same mindset. That's the thinking. That's the belief. Now, I don't know if you've found this, but we we have been given tools as believers to share our faith with others, right? We've got Uh, Bibles and tracts and um, scriptures and books that we can give videos now and uh, even apologetics where we can defend the gospel or share with others. A lot of tools that have been created to share and defend the gospel. But the reality is, and and we're to do that, I'm not negating that, I'm saying that's our role, to share our faith and to share our story and our testimony. But until that person (laughs) says, all right, you know what, I surrender, enough of me, And they say no to themselves, they give up their selfish ambition, they give up their pride, they realize they're not the one calling the shots, but in this case, the the Lord Jesus is calling the shots and they surrender. (laughs) Then, till that belief and that mindset clicks in, it's, as the scripture says, you're throwing your pearls before swine. They're, They're just, it's a waste. And so, part of the way we need to pray, and I've been doing this a little more in my own prayer time, I have what I call the five. And there's more, but I have the five, and they're five Uh, young men, relatively young men, that I'm praying for every day. I pray for five. Um, And uh, 
it just I call them the five, and the Lord knows that when I bring them up. The last three weeks now I've been praying, and I'll say, well, Lord, I'm praying for the five, and then I'll name the five. And I'll say, I'm praying, Lord, that you would open the eyes of their heart to see that they are not the Lord and you are. They are not the boss of their life and you are. I've shared this illustration before, but I think that, and we're not, you know, we don't live in a a part of the world where this happens, but earthquakes, you know. The couple that I've felt, little tremors that I've felt ever, you know, have haven't you know hardly been noticed but i i can only imagine people who live in california other parts of the world where they have these nine point whatever ten point whatever they are you know or some of the ones that are getting bigger and bigger around the world what do you do folks when the very earth you are trusting in and standing on gives way i I, then you must understand yeah i'm really not in control I don't get to tell the sun where to be, the moon, the stars where to be. I don't get to tell the earth whether it's going to open up today or stay solid. There is a God. There is a Lord, Jesus, who's been given for us to think differently about and believe differently about. And I'll tell you today, the Word of God says, today is the day of salvation. Believe today. Take a moment today to realize you're not the boss. You really, how much control do we really have in life, right? Right? You think about it, you know, how much do you really control around you? I was, uh, this was funny, a couple weeks ago I was dreaming early in the morning. I'd woken up and then I went back to sleep. And I was dreaming that I was uh, with a group of friends and we were, we were in this room, we were uh, busy about an activity, and then the power went out, boom, and it was pitch black. There were no windows in the room, and it was all pitch black. And I thought, how are we going to get out of here? And then I woke up from my dream and realized our power went out, for real, in our house. <laughs> and somehow my dreaming mind knew that what happened in the real had then happened in the dream. And I thought, man, I don't even have control of my dreaming, let alone the power going on and off in my house. Like, what really do we have control of? I think it's a much better step to say, you know what, Lord, I believe that you are God. You sent your son. He's Jesus is Lord. I'm not. And so I just surrendered to that. That's the first step. That's got to be the first step to acknowledging him as Lord. It's believing in your heart. Here's the second one. Then there's gonna, going to be naturally a serving. A serving Jesus as Lord, or surrendering. You could, you could put it that way. I went back and forth between the two. Look at verse 6. It says, Jesus, who in very nature God, that phrase in the original language means equal to, exactly as, same person as God, one and the same. And so if you're arguing, well, I don't don't think it means that, well, go to the scholars in the original Greek and see that's exactly what it means. Jesus, equally God, truly God, didn't there wasn't looking for equality with it but he wasn't saying i need to be equal with the father he already knew who he was and as part of the trinity knew that his role in the trinity and so he wasn't looking for that to be something that he needed to achieve that's what verse six is saying he was equally god he wasn't that wasn't something he needed to worry about but look what he did verse seven and this is the power of the gospel he made himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant our lord took on the nature of a servant, took on the activities of a servant. Now, aren't you grateful for this today? Because without Jesus coming, we are lost. Without him coming and dying our death on the cross that we deserve because we're sinful people, he came perfectly, gave his life, buried in the tomb, rose from the dead, amen, and is coming again. And he served us by doing this for each of us. That happens as he realized, I don't have to try and prove anything on this relationship instead i'm going to serve i'm going to serve others even as the lord verse 8 says he was found in appearance as a man but he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death on a cross this is our lord this is this is our our god who has come and i can't even my mind doesn't wrap around it when i'm with my little granddaughter green and i was looking back at pictures from a year ago where she was this tiny little baby that you could just hold in your arms and she'd just look up at you you know with the squinty eyes that babies you know have and you could smell their head you know the baby smell you just oh the good baby smell i know there's bad baby smells too right yeah i get that uh but the good baby smell because in the bad baby smell you just hand her back to mom right but you know the good baby smell just those moments and i was looking through some of those pictures and then we were walking through i think it was ikea heather and i were walking through ikea together and cassie sends me a picture of our little granddaughter green who now has way more hair than me but it's pulled up in a in a fountain bobblehead kind of like poop 
like this up top. And I just begin to laugh. And I, so I'm sending videos to, her, to Cassie of, of Heather and I walking through Ikea, and we're saying, hi, Green, we love you. It's Grandma. Grandma. And people are looking at us like, what's going on? I'm like, whatever. Listen, there's bedrooms in here. If you need a rest, go sleep at Ikea, right? You, don't bother me. I'm talking to my granddaughter. You know, bop, 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 bop. I'm having a great time. You know, I'm just away, away we go. And being silly and walking around in there, and people are looking and thinking, what are those two up to? I'm happy to humble myself when it comes to my little granddaughter. I'm just going to be silly, and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to, I'm going to come to her level and, and talk with her language and celebrate everything that she can and can't do as though it's just amazing, because it is to me. Our God, he loved us so much, he came right down to our level and gave his life through his son for you and I that we might be free. What a powerful picture of a servant. Have you ever been served by someone who you know their rank was higher than you, or that was your boss, or that was your pastor, or whatever it might be, someone whose rank was higher, and they came in and you found out later they were serving you, and you thought, wow, I should have been serving them. Think about this on this level, that we are not just called to believe He is Lord, but we are called to serve Him as Lord. Hear me, not because we have to. <laughs> it's not like that we have to serve Him. It's that we get to serve Him. Isn't that amazing truth? We switch our thinking and say, Lord, I get to serve you. I get to get up every day and share the truth of, of your love with others or be that smile or that friendly face or that word of encouragement. I get to be your hands and feet in this world right now because you first loved me. And we get to, as verse 9 says, God exalted him and gave him the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name. I think I shared with you last week, uh, or maybe it was with our men's group, I can't recall now, but um, there, and I'm sure in your groups as well, there are many people who take the name of Jesus and they use it in vain, or they use it without thinking, or even as a curse word. And uh, it does bother me. I don't like that. And not that I prefer other curse words, I don't. But um, when people use the Lord's name in vain, it really does kind of, it's a little extra shot, and, and I, I don't like that. And I was talking to the Lord about this, and just kind of saying, oh, you know, should I be saying something about this? What should I, should I speak up about this? How should I handle this? And I really felt the Spirit say, as you hear those people using my name in that way, begin to pray for them. Begin to pray for them that as they use my name in a derogatory way or in a way where they're not even thinking about the name of Jesus or what it might mean, pray for them that there would, their eyes would be open to the power and the beauty and the majesty of the name, amen, that is above every name. And I thought, wow, so I've been doing that. As people, you know, say the name of Jesus and use it in a derogatory way, I'll look their way and just say, Lord, help them to understand the beauty of your name, the power of your name, that there's healing in your name, salvation in your name. Transform them. Open their eyes. Because the truth is, they're blind. <laughs> If you don't have Jesus today and you don't understand who Jesus is, then you're blind. And you can say to a blind person, don't you see this? Look harder. They can't see it. They, until the miracle of sight comes and God opens their eyes. Do you hear what I'm saying? The Spirit quickens their heart. Then all of a sudden they see, well, that's our part. To be a light and to be a person who would come along and pray for others and, and speak the truth to others. And that's the third point this morning, that ultimately... We need to get to a place where we em embrace or believe that Jesus is Lord. We've got to embrace it. We've got to say, yes, you are my Lord. You are my Jesus. And you know, uh, I remember when, when uh, our oldest Cassie was little, I remember we were at a party one time, and I noticed that uh, another friend of mine, there's a bunch of young couples and young families there, uh, we were wearing similar, we had dressed similar, not the same, wasn't weird like that, but similar, similar colored jeans and, and a top, and we had a similar no hair hairdo, uh, right? So <laughs> we were walking around at the party and talking, Cassie was just a little toddler with her curly little hair, and I remember watching her, just kind of keeping an eye out for her, and Heather and I were visiting with other people, and I watched her zip across to my friend who was dressed similar as I was, and she just went right over, you know how toddlers will do that, they just lock onto your leg? And they just kind of grab onto you, and she thought she had me, but really it was my friend's leg. She just kind of grabbed on, and then she's looking at other people, and everyone kind of chuckled a little bit, and then she looked up and realized, oh, not my daddy, you know, <laughs> kind of moment. And I was making my way over to her, you know, to kind of make my way across to her, because I knew this would kind of, you know, surprise her a little bit, or, or spook her a little bit. But, and then as soon as I was coming towards her, she sees me and just kind of runs, and then it was right up into the arms. 
And I don't think the rest of that night she let me go, you know. <laughs> just like, and she was saying, my daddy, my daddy, you know, kind of thing. Like, and looking back at the other guy, like, he was a villain, <laughs> you know. <laughs> she realized, no, this is my daddy, that wasn't my daddy. But there was an embracing, there was a moment where she was like, yes, this is the final piece that is an important piece in that fact that Jesus is Lord, the reality that Jesus is Lord. Verse 10 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, earth, and every tongue, look at this word, will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That word means to recognize, to see for what it truly is. You see, we pray right now for people who use His name in vain. One day they will see that Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess He is Lord. He was the, all along. He was the boss. All along He was the King. And I missed it. And so we don't want to be uh, like in that moment of you know wondering and curious, but we want to just run into the arms of Jesus now and go, you are my Lord. I embrace you now. You have the say in my life. You, have, you can tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing, where I should and shouldn't be uh, involved, where I should and shouldn't be act, taking action. That's all you, Lord. And so you have every right. That's what that means when it says your tongue acknowledges and recognizes Jesus Christ is Lord. Just a little free piece here before we go to the next couple of verses. You know, even the devil and his demons know who Jesus is. Do you know that? That even they know, more so than many people in our world, that Jesus is real, that he is God's son, that he did come, die, uh, was buried in the grave, and uh, rose from the dead. And they know he's coming again. They know, the devil knows the Bible, but the devil has not submitted to Christ's lordship, nor will he ever, nor believe or rest on him or embrace him. And so they have been judged and will be judged for that very thing. We, though, in a season of grace and a time of grace today, as I said earlier, is the day of salvation. Now is the time to acknowledge Jesus truly is Lord. Look at verse 12. Therefore, last part of our text, my dear friends, as you now have obeyed, as you've now taken action, as you've now agreed on this, not only in my presence, but also my absence, look at this, keep working this out. Keep working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Keep working out, that means with some humility, understanding there's going to be Mondays where things don't go well, and then other days on Wednesday where I think, look at me, boy, I read all the Bible in one day. And if that's possible, you know, you know, you're going to have good days and bad days. You're working things out. Some days you feel like you're getting it right. Other times, not so much. And you're learning your way. Work that out. Work out that salvation. You're not working for your salvation. You're working it out. You're figuring it out. I was laughing this week. At a funny little video that comes up on my phone. And it was this dear lady. She gets into a car and all you can see is her view of the steering wheel of this car. And she's in the car and she's, and she's telling everyone, she said, now I'm in this car. And I've owned this car for five years. And I never knew that I had a sunroof. She says, my knee hit this knob. And she shows the knob. And the knob opened up a sunroof. I've had the car for five years. I never knew how it sat at sunroof. And then you can see the camera pan a little bit to the back seat where there's some, I think, some bags or something that she immediately realizes aren't hers. And she says, oh, I'm in the wrong car. This isn't my car. She was in the wrong car but thought it was her car. So she jumps out and then looks over. You know, one car over is a black car, same as hers, no sunroof. Because I was thinking as I'm watching, how could you have a car for five years and you never knew there was a sunroof? I mean, I've got some questions, right? I've got some questions here. You didn't know there was, there was you know, a sunroof in your car, but I just laughed and laughed. I thought, how could she not acknowledge that? How could she not see that? How could she not understand it? And then when she sees the other car and she's zipping over to the other car, you realize, yeah, there's no sunroof. Looks the same. The car looks the same. But, you know, she was kind of lost in the moment. And when I look at this, I think, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. We're working in our salvation. And there's going to be some things we realize along the way for real. And we're going, wow, I didn't know this about God. And there's going to be other things that we, we think, wow, that was beautiful. God revealed a whole level of this, and I need to give these things up and grow here. There are things we're going to make mistakes, and sometimes, you know, we're going to do something, and, and we're going to realize, oh, that was, sorry, Lord, forgive me. We're working it out. But I want to encourage you today. Look at verse 13. It says, for it is God who works in you, look at these two words, to will and to act. God is doing two things in you through his spirit. He is working with your will, your desires, your heart. He's working, in, that's what it says, he's working in you with your will. Because some people say, I don't want to say Jesus is Lord. I don't want to believe on him. If I believe on him, he's going to make me give up all the good things in life and give me all the bad things in life. I'll just tell you, it doesn't work that way. 
It does not work like that. He gives you joy, incredible joy, and peace that cannot be bought by anything the world has to offer. And people will think, well, if I serve him, though, he's going to, he's going to give me all these things that I hate. No, he works with our will. He changes our heart and our mind to show us the very things we thought were good for us and were right for us never were. That he created us, and so he knows how to work with our will. And then he challenges us with, with our actions, right? He'll encourage you, share with your friends. You know, uh, bless this person, give to this thing. He, the Spirit of God, is working with your will and with your actions to transform you and change you into his image and his likeness. That's the work that he's doing. I love this. Uh, to, to kind of wrap it up here with a final step for all of us. I love what I found here in, in one commentary where it says, Jesus is Lord. What is this scriptural meaning? So what's, how does this all come together? And the author says here, following the resurrection, the term Lord being applied to Jesus became more than an indication of devotion or respect. Stating Jesus is Lord, look at this, became a way of recognizing Jesus' divine standing. That Jesus is Lord meant that Jesus is also God. References of Jesus as Lord stated, started with Thomas' declaration when Jesus arrived, remember this, after the apostles, after his resurrection. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, in John 20 and 28. And Jesus never corrected that. And Jesus never said, whoa, 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 no, I'm not God, I'm just your Lord. No, no, he says, my Lord and my God. And the author says, from thereafter, the message of the apostles was that Jesus is is Lord, signifying that Jesus is God. One final thought here. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost carried this same idea. He said, let all Israel be assured of this. And boy, isn't this a great prayer for Israel today? God has made this, uh, this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, Acts 2, 36. And Peter later declared that in the house of Cornelius, stating that Jesus is Lord of all in Acts 10, 36. So he says, it's important to note that when we get to Romans 10, 9, and that's where we're going to conclude here, Jesus' lordship is connected to his resurrection, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I wanted to Bring this together in this way. And I'm going to encourage you to stand with me this morning as we wrap up here uh, this morning. That there are really these simple steps that we need to take if we're going to see our life transformed and see our, ourselves really honor God in this way. And it's a belief and a confess confession, an embracing of Jesus as Lord. We want to have one mind that's united with uh, the Father, that Jesus is who He said He is. He's Lord. And so I need to believe that. And that's why Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, believe in your heart. There needs to be a belief in your heart today. You need to challenge. And if you're watching this today and you're thinking a lot of other things about other religions and whatever, just take a moment to maybe even just pray this prayer. God, if what this pastor is saying about Jesus is real, then show me. You know what? God will show you. He'll reveal himself to you. The Word of God says he's, he's happy to do that and faithful to do that. And just even pray a prayer that, Lord, if this is all true, Jesus, if this is all true, I want to believe, help me in my unbelief. God will reveal himself. But it starts with a belief in our heart. And God is good. He, he will open your heart. He'll, he, the Word of God says he knocks on your heart and, and, and asking you to invite him in. So that belief needs to take place. Now, when that belief takes place, the other great thing, the other service, as we talked about, point number two, or service we're embracing, is confessing Him. And listen, I encourage you, don't just make this a one-time thing. I, I, I appreciate the days of old, we, just as I am without my, one plea, but that thy blood was, I come to thee. And we would have altar calls, and they're beautiful times, and there's been different ways people have come to faith over the years, and there's maybe been one confession at one time you know, that someone has made. I encourage you, this confess with your mouth is not just a one time. Speak it over and over again. Get up in the morning and say, you are my Lord, Jesus. Thank you that you are my Lord. Embrace him anew every moment. In the middle of your difficult Monday, difficult week, say, thank you that you are my Jesus. You are my Lord. You're the boss and I'm not. Because then you can say, Lord, you see what's going on here? Do you see what these people are doing? Just letting you know, I'm not the boss, you are. So, <laughs> you know, Moses did that. He said, well, you know, Lord, the Lord says, you know, I'm not going to go with the uh, children of Israel. You just take them across. I'll give you an angel. And Moses said, whoa, 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 this was all your idea. 
if you're not going with us and you're giving us an angel, I'm not going to take another step. You, these are your people. <laughs> I love that. You know, and we can say that, Lord, this is, I'm living my life for you. So if, if these persecutions are going on, then I look to you. Because this is not about me. I, my reputation and my life and all th- this stuff that you've blessed me with, it's all beautiful, but it's about you. Amen. Heavenly Father, today we confess either for the first time maybe the second or the thousandth time in our life, Jesus is Lord. In our lives, I pray today that many who are watching, maybe for the first time, would believe with their heart, Jesus is Lord, and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and that God, you would show them the beauty of the truth of that. Forgive our sins today, Lord, even for us who've been following you and working out our salvation. Would you purify us today? Forgive us of our sins again today. Relieve the stress and the burden and the pressure. Take, us, take away the things in our life we are dabbling with. We believe that you are coming soon, and we don't want to be caught wasting time with things that are of no consequence. So today we declare it and embrace it and believe it. Jesus is Lord. You are our Lord. And as we leave here in just a moment to go into our world, may we be a reflection of your love. May we be a reflection of your grace and your mercy. And may others see that in us and then find that truth that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for these people today. Thank you for the the beauty of being a part of your church. Bless us as we go. We pray it in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. I wanted to give a little bit of uh, an advertisement for next Sunday. Um, Yes, I know it's Soup Sunday, so it's not about that. Some of you are like, Soup Sunday, right? No, that's a great thing. But next Sunday, I'm going to do my best to, uh, and there's a lot that could be talked about here, but our final piece is about Jesus, our coming King. And there's a lot going on in our world right now. There's a lot of discussion. Actually, in our men's group, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians, which talks about, in all four chapters, Jesus coming soon. We believe he's coming soon. So next Sunday, if you have some questions about our crazy world and all that's going on and what it's supposed to look and how it's going to go, I want you to know that you can find comfort in the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Next Sunday. Don't miss it, all right? God bless you. Have an incredible week in the Lord. And, and, and enjoy the fact that he is Lord. Bless you.